Well, during uh, the 19 years that I was chair, from the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s, Serendipity brought a group of young men and women to Hopkins. Many of them trained in surgery at Hopkins. Others joined the faculty of surgery at Hopkins. And they were a terrific group of people. They were good clinicians, they were good technical surgeons, they were good mentors for young people, they were good clinical investigators, and some of them were good um, basic science investigators. But the thing that bonded them together was their leadership ability. And from that group of people, some became department chairs, some became division leaders, some became uh, program directors, but probably 25 of them became chairs of Department of Surgery around the country. And that accomplishment, I, I don't take all the credit for that. The credit comes from the culture in the Department of Surgery at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. But the fact that so many went on to achieve leadership positions in American surgery is really the accomplishment I'm most proud of. Now, I have to make an exception. I've been married for now 50, uh, correction, 57 years, 58 years, and I have four children. And I'm most proud of staying married for that length of time and having four terrific children. But if you put that aside, then the my part in helping to train these 25 young people who became uh, chiefs of surgery and institutions throughout the country is what I'm the most proud of. Well, I think uh, there are several um, statements that I am fond of. Perhaps the one that I'm most fond of is if you pick a profession you love, you never have to work the rest of your life. And I think academic surgery is that. Academic surgery, anyone who picks academic surgery, I, I think is insured of having a terrific life. I don't feel that I have worked for the last 50, 60 years that I've been at Hopkins. I think it's been a pleasure and a joy to be here. So there really haven't been any challenges. It's a, being in academic surgery is terrific. You make many friends throughout the country. You travel to other institutions and see what's going on so you can come home and make your institution better. You travel around the world. You meet surgeons all over uh, the globe. So I don't think there have been any challenges. It's just been pure joy. I graduated from medical school here in 1962 and have been here in the Department of Surgery ever since, and it's been terrific. Well, the uh, training of the surgeon is interesting, and it's an evolutionary process. Uh, during the 19 or 20 years that I was chief of surgery at Hopkins and chairman of the department, I think the program changed a little bit every single year. I mean, the, the goals, of course, are to train young men and women who clinically are very astute physicians technically are very safe and good technical surgeons in the operating room. That they're good mentors, that they're good teachers, and good investigators. Because even if somebody goes into private practice, they can be an investigator. Every day they see things that are being done that perhaps could be done better. 
And I think it's an evolutionary process, and you train young people, young men and women, to do those things, to be good clinicians, to be good diagnosticians, to be good technical surgeons, how to care, take care of patients postoperatively, but also how to try and make people around them better as teachers, investigators, etc. So it's an evolutionary process, but it's an exciting, terrific opportunity to influence a lot of young people. Well, I, I don't know what makes up a good technical surgeon. It's very difficult. There clearly are some individuals, when they cut a blood vessel, it doesn't bleed. And when they sew things together, they don't leak. And there's, there clearly are people who are exceptional technical surgeons. Not everybody can be that, but everybody can be a safe surgeon. And being a safe surgeon means really following the basic principles of safe surgery. Careful hemostasis, careful handling of tissues, reapproximate tissues clearly, don't leave dead spaces. And those are the principles that everybody can learn, and everybody really can become a safe surgeon. They can't necessarily become a technically outstanding, superb surgeon, but everybody doesn't need to be that. They just need to be a safe surgeon, and I think being taught the general principles of surgery allows people to become safe surgeons. Well, again, I think surgery is the most exciting job that a young man or woman can decide to take on and spend their life doing it. And it, things change every day in surgery. And it's just an exciting discipline, an exciting job to be in. And, uh, you know, I don't understand the term burnout. I'm 81 years old. I still come into the hospital seven days a week. I'm still excited about being here. And when people say they're burning out, I don't understand that. That's a problem with them, not, not the field, because we're in an exciting field that changes constantly. And it's just a joy and a pleasure to be involved in it. Well, the, uh, the evolution of pancreatic, the management of pancreatic cancer over the last 30 or 40 years has been an interesting evolution. Initially, when I first became interested in it, the mortality for doing a Whipple, a pancreatic duodenectomy, was 25 or 30 percent in the literature. That was it outstanding institutions around the country that were willing to publish the results. And you know that in other institutions that weren't willing to publish the results, it was probably even higher. So the, the first task was to make the operation safe. And when I became a chairman of the department in 1984, that was one of the tasks that I took on for the department, is to learn how to do that operative procedure, not just me, but the group that I had with me, which was a, a group of outstanding surgeons. And gradually, the mortality dropped from 25% down to less than, than uh, 5%. And our mortality here, I, I myself have done <clears throat> well over 2,000 uh, Whipples, and my mortality is less than 2%. And here at Hopkins, all of us combined have probably done between five and 6,000 Whipples. And again, the mortality is about 2%. So that the, was the first chore, is to get the mortality for the surgical treatment down. Now, having accomplished that, then other means of therapy had to be developed. And the surgery alone cures very few patients with pancreatic cancer because the time that it's diagnosed, it's already spread. 
probably 80% of the time. So neoadjuvant therapy, using chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and adjuvant therapy after surgery, using chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and now more recently immunotherapy. These, these are all changes that are taking place, have taken place over the last 10, 20 years and are taking place currently. One of the biggest needs for pancreatic cancer is a tumor marker or protein, a protein product that can be measured in the blood so you can screen patients, say, starting about age 40. Every time they go to have a physical examination with their physician, they get a blood test sent that hopefully someday we'll be able to detect pancreatic cancer at its earliest stages. And once a tumor marker is identified, so we can identify the disease earlier, and once the neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy is further defined, then I think pancreatic cancer will not be a bad disease. When I first developed an interest in it, it was a horrible disease. It's still not a good disease to have, but a lot of patients now, their survival can be prolonged substantially. So a lot of progress has been made, and in the next decade, tremendous progress.